to a new series from the Messy Reformation. There's been a lot of discussion and deliberation coming out of Synod 2022 around issues of sexuality. Much of the discussion has focused on whether the decisions made were good or bad, helpful or hurtful. However, Synod made some other declarations that we need to pay attention to. Synod repeatedly encouraged churches throughout the CRC to start having discussions about what it looks like to do pastoral care with those who are sexually struggling. Synod stated that the Human Sexuality Report offered sound introductory guidance for churches that should serve as conversation starters on how to best do pastoral care in these circumstances. Synod also stated that continuing conversation around pastoral care might have a powerful influence on elements of congregational life, such as gospel preaching, faith formation, the diaconate, our missional calling, the sacraments, and church discipline. With these strong encouragements from Synod for continued conversation on the topic of pastoral care for the sexually struggling, the Messy Reformation has decided to begin having some of those conversations, and we plan on dropping these episodes every Wednesday evening. We want to state right away at the beginning of each episode that we view these conversations as the beginning of a conversation. There's no way we can comprehensively discuss every element of pastoral care in such a small period of time. However, we want to start having the conversation and build from here. It's also important to remember that conversations go both ways. We don't want these conversations to remain between the people on the podcast. We want you to get involved as well. As you're listening to these conversations, we would love for you to be in conversation with us. We'd love for you to write down any questions, concerns, or pushback you may have, or anything you really loved about each episode. Then send that feedback to us at themessyreformation at gmail.com. We'll use your feedback to help us build future episodes to further answer your questions and concerns and then further the conversation. We're really excited about the opportunity to begin moving this conversation forward in a way that equips the saints, builds up the church, and brings glory and honor to God. So, get your pens and journals and enjoy the next conversation in our series, Pastoral Care for the Sexually Struggling. back up a step from that because i yeah. so there, there's what to do once somebody is uh there's what to do once somebody actually comes to you or is starting the conversation um i'd like to back up from that and talk about how you're going to get them into the room in the first place that's a good point and, and how they're how they're going to enter into recovery um because this problem is is vast and pervasive um and in our communities, this tends to be something, if it's something that is able to be loudly talked about in your office, but the very word of pornography cannot be uttered anywhere else in the church, um, then what the body is teaching that person is that of all sins, this one is unspeakable. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, with all due respect, you know, I, I know that we have to be delicate around children. Like I'm not, I'm not wanting to say things in really explicit ways around kids. Don't get me wrong. Um, but one of the things that I, I would love to talk to you at length is that this, this starts with uh, this starts with community. And maybe the best way to get at that, um, I want to harken back to Synod for a minute. There was a, a, a well-intended um, overture that came to Synod that um, on my advisory committee, I'm quite proud. I, I actually, this is where a lot of started. I shared my story at Synod with a lot of people and about what's kind of happening in my church, which we'll get to. Um and I, I, that, that I shared it because overture, overturn and overture. And I'd like to talk about why it doesn't work. So there was an overture to Synod that said, um, every pastor, um, should have their computer checked once a year for porn. Now, leaving aside for a moment, the, the, um, tech, technological ineptitude of thinking that I'm storing the porn on the computer, uh, in the day of the internet, um, if that's the behavior that we're going to go go for in order to get people to come out into the open, that's just not going to work. Because look, uh, addicts are, are are excellent liars. I was no exception. And if I were totally in the throes of this, that would never, ever, ever have caught me. Not in a million years. And furthermore, I don't think that it would have changed me either. It would have been a nice deterrent. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm happy that my church's internet connection, I really have to wonder who it is that can look in on that. It's probably a good thing. Um, but deterrence alone are, are, are not going to take care of this. Um, and uh, 
you have to realize that in order to be, I've said this a couple of times now, but in order to be an addict, you have to first be a liar. And mm-hmm. so I think the only way that this changes is that is if we as a church begin to have a culture of truth telling about this and, um, and, and in general, let me, if you'll, uh, if you'll indulge me, this text is one of my go-tos and this is really important. What I want to challenge pastors on right now, and I'll, I'll share a story of what's happening at my church. We will get to that. Uh, But what I want to challenge you on right now is to create a culture where people can talk about the worst things that they've ever done. And I know exactly uh, how radical that sounds, but I don't really know. uh, I don't know another way to take the passage I'm about to read. So this is in, um, this is in first Timothy. Um, It's in first Timothy, Timothy chapter one, verse 12. And Paul's writing to this young pastor and, uh, what I'm about to read is sort of, it's sort of an interjection. It seems almost entirely off course of everything Paul was trying to say, uh, you know, as though uh, something hit in his memory and he's like, I just have to include this. And it's his own testimony. And I want you to realize the, the weighty things that he's saying about himself and ask, how in the world is he able to say this to these people? How in the world is he able to be public about this? He says, I, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. But the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then I imagine immediately after that going, oh, shoot, I have to finish the letter because it's like he almost accidentally finished it preemptively. <laughs> now, you can hear the excitement in his voice about this. Like he's, It's bubbling over out of him. He wants to talk about this, but nested in the middle of this are literally the worst things he's ever done liar, persecutor, violent man, or blasphemer is another, another interpretation. Mm-hmm. And those are words that for him have baggage. You know, he's writing and he knows very well that there are families of people who he killed who are going to be reading this book. It's even one, though I was a liar, he remembers the lies that he told to otherwise justify what he thought was a righteous cause of, of killing and, and, and imprisoning Christians. He remembers those words exiting his mouth just as surely as if they were the lies that put Jesus on the cross. He remembers, says persecutor, violent man. He remembers rocks hitting a young man named Stephen like a hammer over and over and over. He may have even been close enough to have blood splatter on him. Well, that young man was there probably praying for his enemies and he's killing him. And he knows those blows are blows to the body of Christ just as surely as if they were blows that put the, put the nails it through the hands and feet of Jesus. How in the, think about that. I mean, if you have anything you've done terrible in your life, you conjure up that memory. There, there is a, there's a film reel that plays and it haunts you. And he's telling this story and he's telling it in an excited way. Now, why? Because when I've done something terrible, what it does is it reminds me something about who I am. I talked about that earlier, how it, 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 it takes your joy away. And, um, for him, what he explains, he says, because of that, Christ saw fit to pour out his grace on me in abundance, okay, so, you know, to overflowing, um, so that he might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Here's what he is saying. He is saying that when Jesus poured out his grace on me, that no longer was, that's not even who I am before. As a matter of fact, telling the story, this story is not about me anymore. It doesn't say anything about who I am. It doesn't say anything about how anybody else ought to see me because that, that just has nothing to do with who I really am anymore at all. Um, even as he might battle fleshly inclinations, it's just not who he is. He's assured of that. And he says, this isn't my story anymore. This is Christ's story. He says, as I tell this, I'm not telling you how bad I am. I'm telling you how good Christ is. The question I ask now isn't what sort of a person was I that would do this? The question I ask now is what sort of a person looked at that and said, I'm dying for it anyway, right? It Mm -hmm. says that Christ did this 
to put himself on display. Now, in the church, here's what we do. What I'm getting to here is that you don't get a culture that deals with pornography if we decide to be private about all of our worst sins, even when we believe that Christ has forgiven them. Because those things, if we believe that Jesus did what he says he did, those things are no longer my story anymore. What I just shared with you is not a story about how Dave is a porn addict. That's all he is, and he's broken. I sincerely don't believe that anymore. Um, But what happens is over time, you, you begin to tell the story until it doesn't hurt anymore. And now it's a story about who Jesus is and what his power is. I mean, you and me don't get this excited about what the gospel does unless somebody started telling the story about the worst thing they ever did as the story of one of the best things Jesus ever did. That's just that's you can't have one without the other. And what happens in the church when we're silent about porn or frankly, all of the worst sins we've ever created or what what we've ever committed, it does a couple of things. Number one, we reinforce the lie in ourselves that it still has something to say about us by thinking if the body of Christ knew who I really am, they'd run away from me screaming. But the second thing that it does is that anybody else who needs healing and needs a testimony in that area of life, they hear generally Jesus forgives all of your sins, but they harbor suspicion that that one in particular Christ would run away screaming. Imagine what happens in a church, though, when people struggling with sin have people to look ahead to who have healing. Imagine the hope. Imagine the excitement. Privacy about sin is killing our witness about the gospel. And that's not to say we should vomit this everywhere. There are different circles of trust. But what I want to say is that the place that this starts is that we have to begin forming a culture where it is normal to tell stories about some of the worst things that we've ever been, uh, maybe sometimes even as we're wrestling with it. Um, And at that point, and at that point alone, will people begin telling the truth in in appropriate places about porn, and then they can have their healing, not just their forgiveness. Let me tell you how this went at my church. Um, I was preaching out of uh, Philippians, and it was just, you know, you have a moment in a sermon where you realize that the people need to hear something. It wasn't planned. Um, I think it was about, you know, looking forward to the example of others. And I I said exactly what I just said to you. I I realized I'm like, you know what? Um, Our privacy is killing us. Some of you, I know you in the room. I know you guys. Some of you have amazing stories of what Jesus has done. And other people desperately need to know that Jesus is powerful to do that. Others of you have untold stories that you think still have power over you, that you still haven't embraced the fact that that's not a story about you anymore. And as long as you keep that private, Satan's going to be able to lie to you. And I I quoted to them James chapter five. And I said, we need to, if we're going to be a church that has spiritual mothers and fathers to look ahead to, we have to get used to talking about what Jesus did in the very worst parts of our lives. Not the nice things that either are very neatly behind us so that uh, we don't lose any trust or the things that are not very offensive. We have to learn to be very honest about what God is doing or no one will have any spiritual mothers or fathers to look ahead to. And I just, and this is the part that blows my mind even more. Um, I just, I don't know if this was the Holy spirit or what I had for breakfast that morning, but I was like, okay, guys, I'll go first. And I decided I did. It was not nearly as long as when we went here, but I explained to my church, a lot of you are really, really ashamed of porn, even though we know most of the people in this room have struggled with it or are struggling with it. And I actually, in a way, I had to be careful how I said this with kids of a certain age in the room. I said mm-hmm. in kind of coded language. I said, here's your pastor's life. Here's your pastor's struggle. Here's what I've experienced from Jesus. And I saw people leaning in and I saw two wives crying. Um, and I, I leaned in and I said, now, here's what Jesus has done. And now let me ask you guys a question. Do you think more of me for telling that story or do you think less? It's, it's not even an impact. Now, do you think more of Jesus or do you think more or less of him? And I explained, I said, you know, I can't make you do this, but we're going to rise or fall on whether or not we're allowed, we're going to let Jesus gospel show through us, the worst of sinners, just like it did with Paul. And um, now look, it wasn't even that articulate of a sermon. It sounds better now than it even did then. Okay. Some of you are like, oh, if only I could preach that. Well, I tell you what, it's coming out great now. It was a mess when I said it It was unrehearsed. It was just honest. And, um, because I went first, something incredible happened. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've done similar things with youth groups where nothing happens, right? I mean, the spirit moves where he wants. He's the wind. I don't control the wind. I just put up a sail when it happens to be blowing, right? Um, people went off into small groups in my church. And um, I heard afterwards that, and I, I asked permission to share the story. Um, a few of the young men 
they that were they, they said, hey, we need wives. We need to go from our small group right now. We have small groups right after church. We need to go talk alone. And the wives talked and prayed and they confessed and the husbands talked away and they confessed. This was, there were two different groups where this happened. Mm. Um, and I had multiple of them coming to me, me saying, okay, how do we do accountability? How did that work? You, you said it got help. What, what do we do? And now these people are off on their own supporting one another. And I, as a pastor, am doing, you want to know what I'm doing? I'm doing nothing. I'm answering their questions. We're not having a private counseling session where the shame is contained to my office and doesn't impact the rest of their life. And where the voice of the body of Christ is implicitly saying to them, um, you know, by its silence, this isn't acceptable here. There are other Christians that they are walking with. And one of these people is, is, is a very, very good friend of mine. He's one of the ones I mentioned. He's the one I mentioned who he went home, he told his wife and he, um, he basically just said, I'm going from a smartphone to a dumb phone. I'm done with it. Um, now, until our culture of our church, now that only happened, by the way, because there were other people in my church who were getting more and more honest about their sin for years. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, visitors already come to churches and think these people are so holy and they're so past me. I feel so like a fish out of water, um, even if people are willing to tell these stories. But that's been building for years. And, and a lot of that had nothing to do with me. It's just something God did. Mm-hmm. Um, but I use that as an illustration to tell you, folks, we're going to get nowhere as long as we're just going to be private and we'll say that God forgives sin, but we're not going to be specific. Um, if our stories, if we don't let our story become his story, um, I don't think this gets anywhere. Until you have a culture that does that, you'll just have the one person coming to your office, hiding it from everybody else. And that can, I mean, you can do something in that environment. That's better than nothing. I mean, I've done that for years. But I got to tell you, it's a whole lot better when Jesus is working among people whose name doesn't start with the word pastor. And so my challenge to pastors, as you're listening right now, and you can tell, I mean, I'm monologuing hardcore because I'm just, I'm really passionate about this. It's such a big deal. Um, My first question for you, pastor or elder, is honestly, how's your relationship with porn actually going? Really? Really? How do you feel about that? How do you think God feels about that? Um, do you think that he forgave you? I mean, really, like, do you think he knew this? Like, do you think when he went to the cross that he didn't know just how much you were going to hose this up? Um, now, if you accept that, um, Jesus Christ looks at you, and when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. It's not your story anymore. Really, like right now, that has started. And my question, my next question for you is, Who are you talking to in your life to let the body of Christ start doing that to you? And I know full well that may do something to your job, although you may be shocked at how gracious your elders can be. Maybe it's just a short leave, but you got to be willing to put down everything. You know, Jesus told us if we're not, you know, he says, if if you, uh, if you come and follow me and you're not willing to, you know, I forget how, how he words it. I think he says, if he does not, you know, hate your brother or whatever, by comparison, if you're not willing to just give up everything, don't even bother. This may be the moment he's asking you to do this. Um, And I got to tell you, until you have done that, until you have set the pace, um, either one of two things has to be true. Either you're not the leader of your church and someone else is, and the progress came from somewhere else, or you're just not going to make progress. Um, Vulnerability is going to start from you. Um, So just find that first person to start telling the truth to. And then maybe see how you can start battling for a little bit more transparency in your church. And you got to do it in smart ways, right? Yeah. Like you, you can't make it a public therapy session for everybody. It gets weird when people overshare, right? I have no illusions about that, but um, filtering on computers won't work. The gospel will. And um, in order to be, in order to have it be God's story, it can't be your, it can't just be yours anymore. And you got to tell somebody. Yeah. And maybe a good place to start telling that story is is uh, with your elders and your council, right? Yeah. Um, you know, yep. if you can, if, uh, again, it's the same idea that you were saying, like, all right, you're the leader, lead the way. Um, and maybe that starts with you leading the leaders and trying to get that culture just started, even in your council first. If you're in a church that that has a hard time sharing some of these stories. Um, I, I, I always tell people start with your council and get your yeah. leaders to start sharing those stories. And it, it, you know, it functions like leaven through the dough. It does eventually start spreading, but 
but it's got to start there and probably not the best way to do it is like Dave did and just go for it in front of your whole congregation. Yeah. I, I, um, I would not advise that as, as like, I mean, that, that was a unique situation and the room was ready for it. Um, yeah. And the spirit was giving orders. So I followed, but I, I'm not saying that's the only way I'm just saying we need transparency. That's all. Yeah. Amen. And, and I always say, follow the spirits leading, you know, we, we do need to trust that as well. The spirits working in us in the midst of all of this too, but, but it is a good place to be. Um, to be able to at least know you're you're there with your council and your elders, and I think the goal is to to really get there in the congregation. And uh, you know, one a book that keeps popping into my mind as we have this conversation is uh, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer's book Life Together. Yeah, um, and he talks about that um, the importance. He he actually says it so strongly that he's like, you're actually not even in community with one another unless you're unless you're sharing uh, confessing your sins to one another and being open about this you're not you're you're pretend community you're kind of playing house you're playing church but but until you become he says until you actually burden someone else um you're not really in communion with one another um and he talks about just the importance about um he 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 just says an amen to what you've been saying that, that sin and satan are constantly trying to pull you away from community to isolate you, to keep you by yourself. And the only way to really free those grips is, yeah. is to be community and, and to really confess that sin. And so um, it's this weird thing though, right? I I've, I've been trying to figure that out because I've talked to so many people why I think these cultures in these churches, people have been afraid to share their, their sin and stuff because there's been this weird idea that, if I share about my sin and my struggle, then I'm losing my witness. I've heard people say that. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. or if I, if I fail, I lose my witness. And I'm like, actually sharing how Christ has overcome your, your failure. That is your witness. Like that exactly is what your witness that, that Christ meets you in that point and overcomes it. And so like, but, but it's this weird idea again, that, um, I think we, we've lost the power of the gospel. And, and once you get to that place where you're free from it, because um, I have the same thing, I'm, I'm pretty open about my own sin, my own struggles and, and stuff. And I'm, I'm free to do that because I feel like I'm like Christ is here and he's working in me and, and he's forgiven me and people get caught off guard when we start having those types of conversations. But, but it does really lead to a true community for sure. Well, it does. And, and almost, I can think of so many of Jesus commands that presupposes that they are being carried out in community. Like there there's commands from Jesus and some in Paul's epistles that frankly don't make any sense if you're doing it alone. I mean, even when the disciples, they say, teach us how to pray, which by the way is really encouraging to me um, that you can grow up in that culture. You can hang out with a rabbi and still feel confused about that. That should affirm all of us who feel awkward praying or, or reading a Bible. Um, But they say, teach us how to pray. And uh, Jesus doesn't reply with an individual answer. The Lord's prayer is in the plural. You want to learn to pray? Pray, our Father who art in heaven. The assumption when you recite that is that you're not praying it alone. Yeah. Um, which makes sense because when you think about it, you know, you hear somebody pray in church and, um, you know, if you, if you, especially if you have an older person pray in church, suddenly they turn into a King James Bible or like William Shakespeare with all the these and the vows and what are they doing? Like that, that sound, it almost sounds very strange compared to how they normally talk, but that's how they heard their mom or dad pray around the dinner table. Yeah. You get that voice collectively. And I, I just, I don't, man, that Bonhoeffer thing that I haven't, I haven't read that in a really long time, but man, that is spot on that statement that you're, you're not in community until you've burdened somebody else with that, that I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. That hits, that hits hard. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I, I, uh, I've recently been just structuring my morning prayers around the Lord's prayer. You know, I mean, that's, that's been a thing for a long time. Um, but it really has been challenging me when you get to the, give us to give us today, our daily bread, like who, who is the us in the hour in that, right. Or forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's not just you coming to God saying, forgive me of my sins each and every day. It's us. And who's yeah. the us? That's the community that you're in. And so, yeah, yeah, that's a big deal. Um, and I think it's a big deal um, that you were talking about that, that we don't, we don't try to take this on all of ourselves as the pastor, right? You were saying like your yeah. role has 
it's yep. gone down through your church. It's actually gone through your elders, but it's just kind of in beginning. Well, I, I be don't want to, I don't want to overstate the point. Right. I mean, it's not, it's not as though like, I mean, I, I think that we're at, at the head, the head of something or the beginning of something. I mean, I, I'm not going to say like my church has arrived on this, right. That there's transparency yeah. at every level and that the culture is, I'm giving a demonstration of about, of about a dozen people, you know, mm-hmm. out of about 200 and some, right. So take that for what it's worth. I don't want to overstate the case, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm seeing that start for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And I've, I've, uh, our youth ministry, the one that the youth ministry I was at before I came here, we had baked that culture in. Um, actually, um, I should give a warning in this too. So one of the, here's one of the things that happened. I, I gave that, that story right at the beginning of this, where uh, we had this huge night of confession and repentance and openness. And that was a powerful, like that was a massive, it was like three hours of weeping and repenting of sin, like a massive movement of the Holy Spirit. And that was a good thing. And it helped kind of foster this culture of openness and stuff. Um, but you take that um, five, six years down the road, it turned into, let me come and just talk about how sucky my life is. And, yeah. uh, and it, yep. it, it ended up morphing into like the official cry night of this retreat. Everybody knew we we're going to come, yep. we're all going to cry and we're all going to talk about how terrible our lives are. And it got, it slowly got disconnected from the gospel to the point where I just killed it. And I had a whole bunch of kids who were angry with me and I had to explain to them why like, this is not gospel. What, what we're doing here is not gospel and that's why we're killing it. Um, and so that kind of atmosphere, if you try to manufacture it, um, then it's deadly as well because it becomes fake and phony and not, not real either. Right. It's, and so there, there's this fine line of walking in, in true community where we're not trying yeah. to manufacture it, but we're just, uh, we're being open and honest with one another. Managing anything as a group dynamic is just so inherently messy. And it's, it's no, uh, you know, when, when people want to talk about pastoral care around um, issues of sexuality in general, I, I feel like a lot of, I'm not, this can be true of pastors, but oftentimes it's going to be true of parents and spouses and stuff too. People really want it to be neat and it's just not. Um, cha- uh, group dynamics are not neat. Change is not neat. Um, fighting with the flesh is not neat. And like, it's, it is so insanely difficult to manage that group dynamic. And if someone, if someone ever figures that out, uh, please write a book. <laughs> like we could yeah. all use the help. Yeah. Praise God. Well, what kind of uh, final words do you have for pastors in the midst of this? You know, it, it's on everybody's mind, I think. And, and people want to make sure they're doing it well in their churches. Um, what what kind of final words do you have for, for pastors to dive into this more? Um, first one is pastor, start with your own soul. I, I can't repeat that enough. Um, you will not have a, a, a boldness to speak or be transparent or be honest. And, and of course, you have to control what you expose and where. Um, there are appropriate levels of transparency. Um, first, start start with your own heart and your own soul. Um, second thing, thing that I would say is um, recognize that there's a whole host of bits of wisdom that we, we didn't cover here today that you can find in a lot of places. If you enter into this in somebody's life, do your homework. I mean, there's I mentioned that my wife is part of my accountability. You know, uh, she's in on this. Transparency with spouses is good. In not all cases is doing what I'm doing a good idea. Um, There are good guidelines out there for how you can deal with uh, parents who find out that their children are involved in in sexting or pornography. Um, So I would would say I've given you a a starting point, and I I hope that's helpful. And I'd say more appropriately, Paul's given us a starting point. Um, but make sure that that when you get into this, you recognize that you can do your homework, and also uh, that, that you're don't go into it alone. The, the, you talk to other pastors, consult other resources. Um, there's a lot of us dealing with this, and everybody is learning. I don't, you know, porn is morphing so fast that um, even as I give a testimony of what I'm going through, it used to be 10 years ago that I would talk with um, young people about what I was going through, and they go, "Oh, th- thank God that someone understands me and has been where I've been." Um, now the magnitude of the problem and the sort of hook this has actually makes my story look really vanilla and goes way beyond that. So all that is to say uh, the situation is developing and morphing very, very quickly there. No one is fully an expert. It's okay to not know what you're doing. Um, 
Um, but seek out wisdom and, and don't be afraid to wade into this because you get to see Jesus do some pretty amazing stuff. That's it for this week's Pastoral Care Conversation. We've got some great conversations on the schedule, and I'm not sure which one's coming next, but I do know one thing. It's going to be great, so keep an eye out. Until then, don't forget this is Christ Church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season, and keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.